From Hollywood, Camel Cigarettes present the Screen Guild Players. Our stars, Myrna Loy, Frederick March, and Teresa Wright. Our play, The Best Years of Our Lives. Our sponsor, Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Try a camel on your T-zone. That's T for taste and T for throat, where you actually judge any cigarette. See if you don't say, like millions of other smokers, camels suit my T-zone to a T. <laughs> And now, with great pride, Camel Cigarettes present the Screen Guild players in the picture that won nine Academy Awards this past year. Samuel Goldwyn's memorable story, The Best Years of Our Lives, starring Frederick March, Myrna Loy, and Teresa Wright as Al and Millie Stevenson and their daughter Peggy, the roles they portrayed so brilliantly in the screen with George B. Bam as Fred. The Camel Screen Guild players in The Best Years of Our Lives. I got a hunch that most men feel the same way. Going off to war isn't so bad. The really tough part is coming home. That day, there were three of us coming back. Coming back together, but that was an accident. We'd all hitched a ride on the same army plane. Fred Derry, an Army Air Forces captain, young and good-looking. Myself, Al Stevenson, infantry sergeant. Not too young and not too good-looking at the moment under a three-day growth of beard, and Homer Parrish, a sailor, just a kid, you might say, a kid who had two iron claws, where he used to have a pair of hands. Hightailing it for home like that, I guess we were all on the jittery side, only Homer was the one who showed it most, and the closer we got, the more he showed it. You know, from up in the air like this, I bet we'd be able to see the whole town, the high school and the football field. Boy, I've tossed a lot of passes on that field, and the city hall and the parking Hey, we might even see Butcher's Place. You fellas ever been in Butcher's Place? No, right no. Now. Well, Butch Henkel that runs it, he's my uncle. Well, maybe it looks just like a dump, but honest, that's the best joint in town. Good food, good drinks, and... Say, why don't we stop off there for a drink? Not today. Some other time. We'll get together there soon. Well, I... I, I just thought... Hey, kid. Are you all right? Who, me? Yeah. Sure, why shouldn't I be? The Navy took care of me fine. They trained me to use these hooks like nobody's business. I can dial a phone, I can drive a car, I can even put nickels into a jukebox. No, I'm all right. Except that... Except what, sailor? Well, you see, I've got a girl. Her name is Wilma. She lives next door. I'll bet Wilma's a swell girl. She is. And it'll be okay, Homer. You wait and see. Yeah, wait and see. But Wilma's only a kid. She's never seen anything like these hooks. You... You know, riding in these planes makes you kind of sleepy. I... I think I'll go back and take a nap. I'll see you later, fellas. Homer's pretty nervous, huh? <laughs> who isn't? Yeah, who isn't? You married, Al? Uh-huh. How long? Twenty years. Twenty years? We didn't have twenty days before I went over. Married a girl I met while we was training in Texas. Well, now you and your wife will have a chance to get acquainted. Yeah. That's something you won't have to go through. <laughs> oh, you think not? Fred, when she opens the door, I'm just hoping one thing. What? I'm just hoping she'll have a drink in the place. Well, I can't stand here all day, I guess. Well, here goes. Maybe she's out. Maybe she's gone somewhere. Maybe she... I'll get it, Mother. Yes, did you... Dad! What oh, couldn't be? Shh, shh. Where's Mom? The living room. Peggy, who's at the door? Peggy, I thought... Al. Millie. Al, I look terrible. Who says so? It isn't fair of you to bust in like this. I phoned you from Portland, darling. Now, yes, you... but you said you wouldn't be home to... Well, I got a break. I got a lift in an army plane. 
Are you all right, Al? Sure. Are you all right? Of course. Well, if you're both all right, I'll close the door. <laughs> Silly, wasn't it? Yeah. Stand here like this. Melly. I'd better go and draw your bath. How'd you like the dinner, Dad? Did we do all right by our returning hero? That was fine. Fine, Peggy. Melly, didn't, didn't you uh, think it was good? Oh, yes, very good. And this uh, coffee. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> then with that off my conscience, I'll get back to the kitchen and finish the dishes. Well, where's the maid? Is her night out? Our maid took a night out three years ago, and we haven't seen her since. You tell him, Mom. I'm too busy. What do you think of her, Al? Peggy? I don't recognize her. She's grown so old. I tried to stop her, to keep her just the way she was when you left, but she got away from me. I guess she has a lot of boyfriends, huh? She's very popular. Have you told her any of the things she ought to know? The uh, things she ought to know? She worked for two years in a hospital. She knows more than you or I ever will. Oh, yeah. Want uh, more coffee, Millie? <laughs> don't you remember, dear? I don't drink coffee. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's all right, darling. It's terrifying. Pacing won't help. Why don't you... I'm perfectly relaxed standing up. Is there such a thing as a drink in this house? I think so. Right here in the... Wait a minute, wait. I got a great idea. Hey, Peggy, come in here. What's up, Dad? We're going out in the town, the three of us. Not me. I'm going to bed. No, no, Peggy. You two. The three of us. Then I needn't bother opening Wait, this. wait. Don't put that bottle away. Have to start somewhere. Why not here? But uh, I wasn't the only one with a nervous thirst that night. I guess it must have been about a dozen drinks later. Yes, sir, Captain. What'll it be? Bourbon. Water on the side. Right. Hey, Cap, Fred! Homer! So you took my advice, huh? You came to Butcher's place. I had a hunch you might turn up here and... Hey, wait a minute. Why aren't you home? Why aren't you with your folks and, and Wilma? Ah, oh, they got me nervous. They just keep staring at these hooks. Or else they keep staring away from them. Let's have a drink, huh? Not a bad idea. You know, Fred, all we need now is Al. Al? Say, I dropped him at the swankiest apartment house in town. You know what he is? A banker. We'll never see him again. <laughs> well, I'll be, I'll be any day. Hey, look! <laughs> That's my buddy, my old buddy. Hey, hey, it's hey Al. Billy, Peggy, step right up and meet the gang. Now, Al. Homer, Fred, meet Billy and Peggy. It's my wife and my daughter. Oh, that'll you. How do you do? Hello, I'm Peggy. No fooling. You mean you're really Al's daughter? Why not? He didn't tell me about you. He didn't know about me. Hey, Fred, where's your wife? I want to meet her. I uh, haven't been able to find her yet, Al. Uh, she moved and didn't leave her address. She works in some nightclub, and I've been to four or five oh, of them. Oh, don't worry, but... Fred. We'll find her before this night is out. We'll deploy our forces and comb the town. Won't we, Millie? Oh, by all means. And we got the Navy to convoy us, right? Over. Right. Okay, that sells it. Now let's sit down and do some serious drinking and dancing. Millie, may I have this dance? Will it you... would be a pleasure, sir. Fine. <laughs> that should teach you a lesson, young lady. You ought to keep a bottle at home. We had a bottle. That's what got Dad started. You know, I think he's just nervous, that's all. Well, that's plenty. Uh, mind if I sneak another one? Go ahead. It's your stomach. Thanks. So you're Al's daughter. Yes, I, I have been for as long as I can remember. Somehow you you just don't seem like Al's daughter. Uh, actually, I'm not. He's my son by a previous marriage. I won't tell a soul. <laughs> Fred. Huh? What's on your mind, Peggy? It's after two. Why don't you go and call your wife? I don't know the number. She isn't in the phone book. So phone I book? Can't... We don't need any phone book. We're all set. Hey, Millie, let's sit down and have a drink, huh? Come on. Darling, remember, you said just one more. And I meant it, too. Just one more, Millie. That's all you're going to get. <laughs> Captain, my compliments to you, sir. Shall we fly? Shall we take a host? Hey, he passed out. You know what? He's drunk. Come on, let's get him up for the lip. Peggy, you know what? What, Mom? He's drunk, too. Oh. Yes? It's me, Millie. Oh. Oh, uh, uh just a minute. I'll catch my bath. Off. I brought you breakfast. Oh. Oh, 
Coast. Thanks. Fresh orange juice? Of course. I wasn't sure. You see, I had a dream, Molly. I, I dreamt I was home. Gee, I, I've had that same dream hundreds, thousands of times before. I wanted to be sure it's really true this time. Am I, am I really home? It looks that way. Now get back into bed. Why? I'm up. You're being royally treated. You're going to have your breakfast in bed. Oh, I'd rather not. Sit down, Millie. I'd rather not. I, um... I'd better start straightening things up around here. I... I seem to have a vague recollection that we had a daughter. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Whatever became of her? Well, we brought Fred home with us last night, and she's driving him downtown. I think she likes him. Fred? Oh, oh yeah, Fred. <laughs> He's a great guy, even if he was in the Air Force. Well, that's about all I can do in here now. I, uh, I'd better start in the kitchen. Being all alone, Millie. I have to... Yes? Oh, Millie. My wife. Al. Al, darling. No, I'm... I'm sure, Millie. Now I know I'm... I'm home. In just a moment, you will hear Teresa Wright, Frederick March, and Myrna Loy in Act Two of The Best Years of Our Lives. What happy days those were for everybody when the men began to come home from the war. And you saw for the first time more civilian clothes than uniforms on the street. All kinds of long-denied comforts and pleasures began to come back, too. Remember the first time you went right up to a counter, asked for your favorite brand of cigarettes, and got it? Yes, sir. And your favorite may well have turned out to be camels after that wartime cigarette shortage. Because it was during the wartime cigarette shortage when people smoked whatever brands they could get that so many smokers learned they liked camels best of all the brands they tried. Yes, smokers compared most all of the different cigarette brands during the wartime shortage. Compared them for flavor, for mildness, and for all-round smoking enjoyment. And that experience taught more and more smokers that they like Camel's Best for rich, full flavor. Camel's Best for cool mildness. Yes, they discovered that for all-round smoking enjoyment, Camel's suit them best. Result? More people are smoking Camel's than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. And remember, camels by the carton are the best buy. You save both money and time. And now, Camel Cigarettes present the Screen Guild players in Act Two of The Best Years of Our Lives, starring Teresa Wright, Myrna Loy, and Frederick March. I uh, should have thought more about it, perhaps. I mean, the fact that Peggy liked Fred. Millie mentioned it a couple of times, but I guess I was concentrating on myself. The time had come to start thinking of money. You know, that's how it goes. One year it's kill Japs, and the next it's make money. And so, before I knew it, I was back at the bank. Hi, Al. Hello, Homer. Look at this dough, Al. 200 leaves of cabbage. <laughs> I get it every month from old Mr. Whiskers. Pretty soft, huh? Pretty soft. That's enough to get married on. You and Wilma set the date yet? No. Not yet, I... I ain't sure yet, Al. I... Say, I saw Fred Derry the other day. He's working over at Bullard's drugstore. He is? Doing what? Jerking sodas. Jerking sodas? Well, he said he couldn't get anything else. No experience. That's what he used to do before the war. Well, I bet he makes the best soda in town. No, I... I think he's having trouble with his wife. She's got big ideas. Yeah. Fella takes off his captain's uniform. You're doing all right. Vice president in charge of small loans? Yeah. Yeah, with special attention to ex-servicemen. But they're a great bunch, Homer. They want to do things and build things. There's only one trouble with them. What's that, Al? Well, they don't, don't always have enough collateral. You wanted to see me, Mr. Milton? Hey, yes, Al. Sit down. Al, I want you to understand that I'm speaking now not merely as the head of this bank, your employer, but as your friend. You know how I've always felt about you. 
Why, I picked you personally for the job you're doing. And I know you'll make good, but, uh, well, you handle this loan to uh, John Novak. That's right. I approve that loan, Mr. Milton. May I ask, Al, on what basis? The basis of my own judgment. Novak looked to me like a good bet. Al, that's an important point in granting a loan character, but without collateral, without security. Security and collateral. Mr. Milton, in the Army, I've had to be with men when they were stripped of everything but what they carried around with them and inside them. You got so you could tell which ones you could count on. And I tell you this, Novak is okay. His collateral is in his heart and his hands and his... And his guts, it's in his rights as a citizen. No He's... one's denying him his oh, rights. sure we are. If we deny him the chance to work his own way, that's... Now, a... Al, we have every desire to extend a helping hand to returning veterans wherever possible. And we have helped a great many. But we must all remember that this is not our money we're doling out. It belongs to our depositors, and we can't gamble with it. You understand that, Al? Yes, sir. Yes, I understand, Mr. Milton. In the future, I must exercise more caution. Precisely. Now it's getting late. You'd better run along home and get dressed for the big affair tonight. I'll meet you there, Al. 7.30, the Union Club. Al, I think it's very nice of Mr. Milton to give a dinner for his returning war hero. <laughs> you going to wear your uniform? Oh, anything but that. This darn bow tie. Give me a hand, will you, Millie? Sure. Thanks. Peggy's going dancing with Woody Merrill. Bill Merrill's son, huh? His intentions honorable? I doubt it. <laughs> but they're going to be properly chaperoned by Fred Derry and his wife. Fred? Oh, some chaperone. I think Peggy's crazy about him. Who, Merrill? No, Fred. Have you any evidence to support that amazing statement? No, just a hunch. Oh, boy. But my hunches are pretty good. Mom, does this tray look all right? Ah, cocktails. Dad, I made these for Woody Merrill. Well, surely you wouldn't deny your poor old father a drop on a bitter cold night like this. Well, one... Hmm. Not bad. I, uh, I hear you're going to see Fred. Yes. What's his wife like? I don't know. I'll tell you later. Al, you said one drink. Did I? <laughs> that was short-sighted of me. <laughs> Peggy, I was just wondering if, uh... Al. Never mind, Mom. I know what you're thinking. What are we thinking? You're both afraid that I may be in love with Fred. Why, I never had any such idea. Shut up, Al. Peggy... Are you in love with him? Yes, but I don't want to be. That's why I asked him and his wife to go out with us. Once I get to know her, I, I guess I'll stop being so silly, acting like a schoolgirl with a crush on her. There's Woody. I'd better let him in. Excuse me. She's a great girl, Millie. Shakes up a pretty fair cocktail, too. I notice you like them. Yep. Yeah, we don't have to worry about that child. She can take care of herself. Sure. But how about you? appropriate that we gather here tonight to honor one who has gallantly fought for our freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, we greet our friend, our co-worker, and our hero, Al Stevenson. Al, stop applauding. That's you. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here. In fact, I'm very happy to be anywhere. In fact, I'm very happy. <laughs> I uh, would like to begin by telling a humorous anecdote. I know several humorous anecdotes, but I, uh, <laughs> I can't think of any way to clean them up. <laughs> I uh, am glad to see you all pull through the war so well. As Mr. Uh, Milton so perfectly expressed it just now, our country stands... Where it stands today, wherever that is. <laughs> and I'm sure I could sum it all up in one word. <clears throat> no, my wife doesn't think I'd better sum it up in one word. <laughs> but I want to tell you that the reason uh, 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 for my success as a sergeant was due primarily to my training in the Corn Belt Loan and Trust Company. For instance, one day on Okinawa, a major comes up to me and he says, Stevenson, you see that hill? Yes, sir, I said, I see it. All right, he said, you and your platoon will attack said hill and take it. So I said to the major, but that operation will involve considerable risk. We haven't sufficient collateral. I'm aware of that, said the major, but the fact remains there is the hill and you are the guys who are going to take it. 
So I said, I'm sorry, Major. No collateral, no hill. <laughs> and so we, we didn't take the hill, and we lost the war. Now, I, uh, I think that little story has considerable significance, but uh, I've forgotten at the moment what it is. And finally, let me assure you that any opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views of the Corn Belt National Bank. I thank you. Al, you were great. I mean, really swell. Was I, Millie? Thanks. Oh, my head. Why didn't I just leave it at the club? Here, take this. It'll make you feel better. Wait till it stops fizzing. Mom. There's Peggy. Come in, dear. I... I saw your light. We just got in. Have a good time? Not very. Well, what's she like? I'm glad I went out with him, even though it was pretty disagreeable. It took guts, Peggy, but you got plenty. I'll need him. I've made up my mind. Good girl. To do what? I'm going to break that marriage up. You're going to what? You... I can't stand seeing Fred tied to a woman he doesn't love and who doesn't love him. It's horrible for him. It's humiliating. It's killing his spirit. Somebody's got to help him. You're sure he doesn't love her? Of course I am. Did he tell you so? No. Did she? No. So you just jumped to conclusions. He doesn't love her. He hates her. I know it. I know who it. Who are you, God? How did you get this power to interfere in other people's lives? Al, please. Peggy, is Fred in love with you? Yes. You've been seeing him? Only once, at the drugstore. He took me to lunch, and when we said goodbye, he kissed me and... And you think that a kiss from a smooth operator like Fred, do you think that means anything? You don't know him. You don't know anything about what he's like. And neither does she, his wife. Whereas you, possessed of all the wisdom of the ages, you can see into his innermost soul. Yes, because I love him. Because I don't care about his uniform or his flight pay or his coming back and working in a drugstore. And, oh, what's the use? You wouldn't understand. You've forgotten what it's like to be in love. You hear that, Millie? I'm so old and decrepit, I've forgotten how it feels to want somebody desperately. Peggy didn't mean that, did you, darling? <sighs> no, I... I don't know what I mean. It's just that... Everything has always been so perfect for you. You loved each other and you got married. You never had any trouble, so how can you possibly understand how it is with Fred and me? We never had any trouble. Al, how many times have I told you that I hated you and believed it in my heart? How many times have you said you're sick and tired of me, that we're all washed up? How many times have we had to fall in love all over again? Oh, Mom. Peggy, darling. Oh, Mom, I'm so sorry. Never mind about that. We love you, darling. Remember that. No matter what happens, remember, we love you. to have a talk with you, Fred, and I thought Butch's place would be as good as anywhere else. It's okay with me. What's on your mind, Al? I just want to ask you a simple question. Roger. Shoot. Are you in love with Peggy? Is there any law compelling me to answer that? No. Nevertheless, I repeat. Are you in love with Peggy? Yes. I thank you for a short and honest answer. You're welcome. Now, what do we take up next? Your wife. Just where does she fit in this romantic situation? Is that any of your business? <laughs> That's what Peggy said. It's none of my business. Oh, so you've had her on the carpet, too? No, no. She volunteered some information. You see, we have a rather unusual relationship in our family. We tell each other things. I happen to be quite fond of Peggy, and I... And you don't want her to get mixed up with a heel like me. I haven't called you a heel. Yet. Okay, chum. What do we do? Step out and settle this thing in the alley? I wouldn't recommend that as a solution. I've learned a lot of tricks in fighting dirty. I might forget myself and break your neck. And I wouldn't like that. But you see, Fred, I'm fond of you, too. Thanks. But I don't like the idea of you sneaking around corners, taking Peggy's love on a bootleg basis. 
And I'm giving you fair warning. I'm going to do everything I can to keep her away from you, to help her forget you, unless you want to do that yourself. Okay, Al. I don't see Peggy anymore. I'll put that in the form of a guarantee. I won't see her anymore. I'll call her up and tell her so. That satisfy you? Yeah. Anything else on your mind? No. Okay, chum, so long. Oh, and here's a buck for the waiter. Drinks are on me. That was over a year ago. Peggy's never mentioned Fred since then, neither has Millie. Sometimes I almost wish they would. Homer's the only one who talks about Fred every time he comes into the bank. Seems that Fred's wife ran out on him, ran off with a guy that had more dough. They're divorced now, and Fred's got a new job. He's really heading somewhere, and he's a swell guy, that Fred. I only wish I knew some way to... Al. Al, dear. Hmm? Don't make a golf date for Saturday. Remember, Homer's getting married. You think I'd forget a thing like that? An old pal of mine getting hitched? Not a chance. I just thought I'd mention it. Al, I suppose that Fred will be there. Yeah? Be nice to see him again, won't it, Al? Yeah, yeah, sure. Al, why don't we bring him back here to dinner? Huh? Millie, would would you please say that again? I said, why don't we bring him back here to dinner? Oh, 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 Millie, darling, you're wonderful. Why? No reason. You're just wonderful, that's all. Let's have a drink. Now? Why not? The wedding won't be until Saturday. Oh. <laughs> Our stars, Myrna Loy, Teresa Wright, and Frederick Marsh will be back at the Camel's Green Gill microphone in just a few moments. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. That's a mighty impressive statement. It's based on a nationwide survey conducted by three leading independent research organizations. They asked 113,597 doctors, doctors practicing in every field of medicine and in every state of the Union, what cigarette they smoked. The brand name most was Camel. So why don't you try a Camel on your T-zone? That's T for taste and T for throat. Your true proving ground for any cigarette. See if Camel's rich, full flavor isn't just right for your taste. See how Camel's cool, cool mildness agrees with your throat. And now, on behalf of Camel Cigarettes, our thanks to you, Frederick March, Myrna Loy, and Teresa Wright, for a deeply moving performance. Well, it was wonderful to be playing those scenes again with Teresa and Freddie. Yes, Myrna. And especially on this show that does so much to support the Motion Picture Relief Fund in its country house. Well, since everybody's so happy... Here's something else to make you feel good. Every week, the makers of Camel Cigarettes send free camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, among other hospitals, free camels go to U.S. Naval Hospital, San Diego, California, U.S. Army Station Hospital, Fort Riley, Kansas, Veterans Hospital, Kikotan, Virginia. Happy days, guys. Your camels are on the way. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Don't forget, Monday night is always a brilliant event in the Camel Screen Guild Theater. Hollywood's greatest stars in Hollywood's greatest stories. Next Monday night, one of the most delightful comedies of the current season, with two of Hollywood's outstanding stars, Ray Milland and Betty Hutton in The Trouble with Women. Be sure to listen. The Best Years of Our Lives was directed by Bill Lawrence, adapted for radio by Harry Cronman, with music by Wilbur Hatch, and was presented through the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn, producer of The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Myrna Loy is currently working in Mr. Blanding's Bill's His Dream House, an RKO production. Frederick March will next be seen in Another Part of the Forest, a Universal International production. Teresa Wright appeared through the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn and can be seen in the best years of our lives. Listen to Von Monroe with Colonel Stupnagel and Burl Davis on the air for camels every Saturday night over most of these CBS stations. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood saying good night and won't you have a camel? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, Camel Cigarettes presents the Screen Guild Players. Our 
stars Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. Our play, Sweetheart. Our sponsor, Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a Camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking Camels than ever before. T for taste and T for throat. That's your T zone. The place where you judge any cigarette. If you want a Camel smoker now, just try a Camel on your T zone. See how Camel's rich, full flavor hits the spot with your taste. How Camel's cool, cool mildness registers with your throat. Tonight, the makers of Camel Cigarettes present the screen gill players in Victor Herbert's immortal operetta, Sweetheart. With Hollywood's most beloved singing sweethearts in the roles they made so famous on the screen. Jeanette McDonald as Glenn Marlowe and Nelson Eddy as Ernest Lane. The Camel Screen Guild players in Sweetheart. For six years, they've been the biggest hit on Broadway. And Felix Lehman, their producer, has grown fat with profits and lean with worry. For six years, he has tried to tell himself... Uh, so what? Suppose I haven't got a contract with them. What can Hollywood offer that Broadway can't? And for six years, Norman Trumpet has had the answer. Hollywood is the natural fulfillment of Broadway. My studio wants them, my studio needs them, and someday my studio is going to get them. How do Glenn and Ernest feel? Well, mostly tired. Six years without missing a single performance. Six years of boisterous, adoring crowds. Six years of discipline imposed by Kay Jordan, who acts as secretary for both. Tonight, for example, walking in on Gwen. Oh, no, you don't. Not a single chocolate. You're half a pound overweight right now. And a few minutes later in Ernest's room. Oh, no, you don't either. You put down that pipe until the show is over. Well, yesterday I heard you cough twice. Six years of slavery. Six years of success. Six years of something that doesn't change. After each performance, a little note is slipped under Gwen's dressing room door. A little note unsigned. There was one tonight. Six years, it would like six minutes. Six minutes without you, I like six years. And one last night? Whenever anyone asks you what I'm doing... Just tell them I'm thinking about you. And the night before? All the world's asleep but us. But we are the ones that are dreaming. After every performance, matinees included. And Gwen has saved every one of them. There's no doubt about it. Gwen's in love. And now she looks up happily at a familiar knock. Good evening, Miss Marlowe. Remember me? Oh, yes, Mr. Lane. The man in gray. Some uh, six years ago, wasn't it? Six years ago tonight. <laughs> My suit's lasted pretty well, hasn't it? Mm, beautifully. Mine has too, remember? The something in blue. Ah, oh, you both get prettier every year. You better come in if you're going to get personal. The hair. Now, do you mind if I kiss my wife? <laughs> I'd love it. Six years ago tonight, Mrs. Lane. Yes, yeah, six years. Oh, Speaking away after the show opens. Such a funny way to get married. Very good way. 
In fact, I'll never get married any other way. Neither will I. Oh, darling, darling. Any uh, changes you'd like made, Mrs. Lane? Mm Mm-hmm. Quite a big one, Mr. Lane. Huh? Mm Mm-hmm. But I don't see you enough to tell you about it. Well, tell me now. That's what it is. We don't see enough of each other. We certainly don't. And we're going to fix that. Starting tonight. Starting tonight. Where are we going? Well, where do we go every year? To our own little table at Angelo's. Just think of it, we'll be let alone. And nobody will ask us to sing. No, and there won't be crowds of moonstruck women climbing all over you for autographs. And no orchestra playing the hits from Sweetheart. And we'll be alone. And we'll be together. Oh, it'll be so peaceful. So quick. Kitty, Kitty, I've got the grandest idea in the... Uh, well, where are you going? Out? I'm going out, too. Good night, Billy. But, children, you can't. You can't go out this way. You're supposed to come to the party. What party? My party. Just a little table at the Mirabeau. Sorry, old man. We've got another date. Mm, but thanks for asking us. Good night. But you can't run out. You've got to come. We've been planning it for weeks, for months. Not for... tonight, Felix. I'm putting my foot down. And I'm putting my foot down, too. Well, you don't have to put your feet down on my heart. Oh, dearie. Don't talk like that. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just the disappointment. Don't you mind. Just... Just forget about me. Oh, darling, we could never forget you. Oh, go ahead. Don't think of us. Just turn your back on the few old friends who wanted to share your happiness. Now, just a minute. We never turned our back on an old friend in our lives. And you needn't think we're going to start tonight. Where'd you say that party was? The, um, uh, Mirabeau. Just a few old friends. Oh, that's all. Just a few old friends, uh, more or less. <laughs> Darling, just wait till I get my hands on Felix. Yeah, me too. Just a few old friends. A couple of hundred I've never even met. And of course, there just happens to be a broadcast. Mm, nothing much. Just a little coast to coast look up. And all the chorus here from the show, and the press, and the cameraman. I'm going to break his neck. Too bad you can't do it before he gets to that microphone. Yeah, I wonder what he'll say as if I didn't know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, I wish you could be here with us tonight at the Hotel Mirabeau, where we're celebrating the sixth wedding anniversary of Gwen Marlowe and Ernest Lane. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's all we're doing, of course. This is no publicity stunt. Why, I'm not even going to mention Sweetheart, the show they're starring in at the Melody Theatre. We're not here to talk about Sweetheart. About the way Sweethearts has broken all records, playing to capacity every night for six years, matinees Wednesday and Saturday. No, we're here tonight just to forget Sweethearts and uh, have a good time. When was that show we're here to forget? <laughs> Darling, I've never even heard of Sweethearts. That's why we're here, to eat and dance and uh, maybe hear a few songs. Uh-oh, here we go. That'll be a nice change for us. Which reminds me, our two stars have asked particularly to sing for you. And since they're so anxious, I'd better not keep them waiting. Ah, yes, here they are. They're coming up to the microphone now. And uh, I believe they're going to sing Pretty as a Picture. When, Ernest, the microphone is yours. And you know what I'd like to do? Oh, uh, what? I'd like to... Sing, of course. Mm. You're pretty as a picture. to his girlfriend said...
darling. Oh, I could fall asleep at the drop of an eyelid. I could kill Felix for doing that to us. Killing's too good for him. We ought to put him through our routine for a year. Radio, publicity stunts, charity dinner. Yeah, performance every night. Mm, matinees, Wednesdays, Saturdays, and holidays. Oh, darling, why do we do it? For dear old Felix. Well, isn't it time we thought of ourselves? That, uh, that Mr. Trumpet was at the party tonight. You know, from Hollywood. I know. He uh, mentioned that his office still good. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Uh, he said you don't have to be on the set until noon. And you're through by three. Mm. And you have your evenings all to yourself. And the climate's terrific. It never rains. <laughs> well, uh, practically never. And everyone has his own orange farm. Yeah, yeah. You can go out in the backyard and chop down your own fruit tree. <laughs> and why don't we? Let's tell Trump that we'll sign a contract. I did. Tonight. Oh, darling, you're wonderful. Now all we have to do is break it to Felix. I did. Tonight. Darling, you're wonderful. Oh, oh California, here we come. <laughs> well, the sentiment's right, but the theme's wrong. Uh, got anything better, Mrs. Lane? Mm, I think so. Jeanette McDonald in Act Two of Sweetheart. It was a brilliant September night in 1913 when the new Victor Herbert smash hit Sweetheart opened on Broadway. The audience of First Nighters was enchanted by the Victor Herbert melody, and the passage of time has not dimmed the charm of this stirring music. More people know and sing Victor Herbert songs now than did in the days when they were new. Yes, you know, good things have a habit of gaining in popularity. Take Camel Cigarettes. Always a great favorite. Camels are more popular than ever. In fact, more people are smoking camels than ever before. Why? Well, smokers learned a great deal about cigarettes during the wartime cigarette shortage. Because they couldn't always get their favorite cigarette brand, they smoked whatever they could get. Yes, smoked and compared many different brands. That experience taught so many people that for rich, full flavor and for cool, cool mildness, Camels stand out from all the others. Yes, millions of smokers have found camels suit them best. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. And don't forget, a carton of camels is one of the merriest ways of saying Merry Christmas. Camels come in special gay Christmas cartons with a space right on the carton for you to write your personal Christmas greeting. Camel 
Cigarettes now presents the Screen Guild players in Act Two of Sweetheart, starring Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald. Well, the unbelievable has happened. Ernest and Glenn are leaving the show. And Felix Lehman's gold mine will soon run dry. Only one more performance to go. And Felix is in gloomy conference with Leo Crump, who happens to be the author of Sweetheart. Oh, it's no use, Leo. I tried every trick I know. They mean it this time. That's the end of Sweetheart. It isn't fair. What will become of me? You'll probably have to go to work. <laughs> you mean there's no hope? They've signed the contract? Oh, they don't have to worry about contracts. They're the greatest team any producer ever had. That's why Hollywood wants them. Hollywood wants them. As a team, yes. But suppose they were not a team. Sure, and suppose they couldn't sing. But uh, what if they were separated? Well, we might have a chance. How can you separate two people so much in love? That's the whole idea. I have a play, a great unproduced drama. It cannot be wrong. What are you talking about? It is founded on a universal truth. A woman in love can always be made to believe she has a rival. You say these two are so much in love? Well, what else would you call it when he slides notes under her door all the time? Notes? What do they say, these notes? Ah, how should I know? They're love notes, I guess. Gwen keeps everyone he ever wrote. They're locked up in their dressing room. In a dressing room? Ah! Ah! Felix, my friend, your worries are over. The day is saved. It is Leo Kronk who promises this. Marlowe and Blaine will not go to Hollywood. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for their final radio appearance in New York, until next week when the Sweetheart's Hour will originate from Hollywood, when Marlowe and Ernest Lane bring you one of their best-loved duets. And here they are now. The Sweethearts of the Sweetheart Hour sing Every Lover Must Meet His Fate. Every Leo Kronk is here. 
Leo. He says it's important. Okay, not now. With all I've got to oh, do... Oh, Queen, my dear, I came right up. I didn't want to keep you raging. Oh, that's what I like about you, Cleo. Leo. You're, you're so thoughtful. Oh, <clears throat> oh you'll excuse me. Uh, there are a lot of things to do. Ah, Gwen, Gwen, I have great news for you. For me? For you. I've written a play, a magnificent play, and I'm going to lead it to you. Oh, no, Leo. I, oh, I mean, not now. I, I've so many things to do. I haven't packed. Oh, you can go on packing. I read it loud. Oh, but Leo, You see, dear. you are in your room, and your husband enters, and he says, as you know, my dear, we have been married a long time. And you say, does it seem so long to you? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Shoes. And he says that six years with you are like six minutes. Six minutes without you are like six years. Oh, these shoes are so hard to pass. They... What What did he say? Six years with you are like six minutes. Six minutes without you are like six years. That's charming, isn't it? Yes, very charming. Did uh, Did you make it up yourself? Uh, the, no, not exactly. And then you say, oh, Cyril, are you really happy with me? And he says... Uh, I mean, uh... I'm, I'm just curious about that line. It's, uh, it's so sort of special, if you know what I mean. Oh, it is special. It was a note written by a man very much in love. I just borrowed it. Really? Uh, who, uh, who is he, Leo? Oh, I know only the lady in the case, and I cannot betray her confidence. You see, uh, the man is married. Oh. Oh, so he's married. Yes, yeah, one of those very sad stories. She's been writing notes like that for years. You mean, you mean the girl showed you other notes from him? Oh, she has hundreds. She writes one every day. I have several of them in my play. For example, uh, here on uh, page 27. Whenever anyone asks what I am doing, just tell them I'm thinking about you. Oh. And here's another, page 81. All the world's asleep but us, but we're the ones who are dreaming. Oh, please, Leo, please. I, I can't stand any more. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, not now. I've, I've got so much on my mind. Perhaps some other time. Oh, I understand, my dear. There's a day of confusion. But it is Leo Kong who promises I will dedicate my play to you. Good afternoon. Oh, Ernest. Oh, Ernest, how could you? <laughs> Variety today, Lane and Marlowe are split. Winslow says they split wider than half past twelve, and that Hollywood deal is off too. Yeah, Felix is sending sweethearts on tour, two companies, one of them in each, and going in different directions. What's it all about? Huh? I guess that's what Lane would like to know. Says his wife won't even talk to it. Well, it's tough on them, but it's a break for Felix. Boy, well, those road companies clean up. <laughs> Chicago, Topeka, Duluth, Sioux City, new house records every city we play. Why, Miss Marlowe, that ought to make you feel mighty good. Yes, wonderful. Pittsburgh, Wheeling, Cincinnati, Columbus, standing room only in every town. Mr. Lane, you must be a pretty happy guy. Yeah, overjoyed. You know, Gwen, it's rather strange the way you grab that copy of Variety every week. You never had time to read it in New York. Well, I've got more time now. And I'd like to know where, I, I mean, uh, I mean, what other road companies are doing. Yes. Where is Ernest this week? I wasn't reading about Ernest. I was just looking at the... Oh, oh, Leo Cole's new play opened in New York. Hmm, what sort of notice did it get? It says, uh, this turkey dishes out the nutty idea that any femme in love will believe hubby has another girlfriend. What plot there is concerns how dopey wife is made... ...to believe that husband is playing out of bounds. Minor character steals love letters husband has written and plants them so that wife is convinced spouse, spouse is two times... Time time another, ...another woman. Wife is screwy enough to fall for this trite, but audience is not, and... Okay... Hey, I must have been crazy. Come again? The phone. Where's that phone? Hello, hello. Operator, I went long distance. Hello. Hello, operator. I went long distance. Oh, it can't be busy, operator. It can't. Try again. It can't. It can't be busy. Get, 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 keep on trying, will you? Hello? Hello. Oh. Uh, darling, oh, I was reading about Leo's brain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sweetheart. Sweetheart. <laughs>
is Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy will be back at the Camel Screen Gill microphone in just a few moments. A good doctor has to be a man of good judgment. Well, good judgment applies to pleasures as well as to the big important decisions of life, you know. And more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette, according to a nationwide survey. Yes, three leading independent research organizations discovered this when they made a nationwide survey of doctor cigarette preferences. They asked 113,597 doctors, doctors practicing in every state of the union, what cigarettes they smoke. The brand name most was Camel. Yes, millions of smokers find that Camel suits their tea zones to a tea. Tea for taste and tea for throat. Try a Camel. And now our evening wouldn't be complete without a word of thanks to our two gracious stars who took time from their Christmas shopping to give us such a delightful half hour. Well, that's not very much to give, considering how much this program does for the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. That's right, Jeanette. The fund gets all the proceeds from this show. And that's one reason why we're always happy to appear with the Camel Screen Guild players. The other reason, of course, being that Christmas is the traditional time for remembering friends with gifts. But the makers of camels remember the men in servicemen's hospitals every week throughout the year with gifts of free camels. This week, free camels go to U.S. Army Station Hospital, Fort Ord, California, National Naval Medical Center, Bethesda, Maryland, and Veterans Hospital, Tucson, Arizona. Your free smokes are on the way, boys. Happy smoking. And a Merry Christmas. Good night, everybody. Yes, Monday night is always a brilliant event in the Camel Screen Guild Theater. Hollywood's greatest stars in Hollywood's greatest stories. Next Monday night, our annual treat for every kid in the family from 6 to 60. Walt Disney's charming and hilarious story, Pinocchio. And a delightful radio version starring Fanny Bryce as the one and only Baby Snook. And Hanley Stafford, of course, as her daddy. It's a real Christmas joy. Be sure to listen. Sweetheart was directed by Bill Lawrence, adapted by Harry Cronman, with orchestra under the direction of Wilbur Hatch. Was presented through the courtesy of Ella Herbert Bartlett and also Metro Golden Mayor, producers of Cass Timberlake. Jeanette McDonald is soon to be seen in the Metro Golden Mayor production of Three Daring Daughters. Listen to Bond Monroe with Colonel Stutnagel and their guests, the Delta Rhythm Boys, on the air for camels every Saturday night over most of these CBS stations. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood saying good night and won't you have a camel? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, Camel Cigarettes present the Screen Kill Players. Our stars, Joan Fontaine, Patrick Knowles, and John Sutton. Our play, Ivy. Our sponsor, Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Your taste and your throat form your T-zone, where you judge any cigarette. Now, the T-zones of millions of smokers have awarded first place in smoking pleasure to camel cigarettes. To make sure you're getting the most in smoking pleasure, try a camel on your T-Zone. See how your taste enjoys camel's rich, full flavor. How your throat likes camel's cool, cool mildness. Tonight, Camel Cigarettes present the Screen Guild players in one of the season's most absorbing dramas. Sam Wood's great hit for Universal International Pictures, Ivy. It stars Joan Fontaine in the title role, with Patrick Knowles as Roger, John Sutton as the inspector, and Dan O'Herlihy as Jarvis Lexton. The Camel Screen Guild players in Ivy. Over and over, it, it isn't true. It, it's a dream. It never happened. It never happened, and yet... Roger Gretericks is going to die. It isn't as though I, I planned the whole thing. In a way, it isn't my fault at all. You can't blame a person for wanting things. I mean, well, Jarvis and I had nothing, nothing, and 
going about the way we did, knowing all the best people, asked to all the, the best places, and then coming home to that shabby little flat. Well, you felt the same way I did. Darling, a little more gently, please. I'm afraid that door is on its last hinges. Oh. Now, what's the oh, trouble, Angel? This awful, awful little flat. Jarvis, isn't it horrid having to come back to this? Well, of course, I prefer Lady oh, Flora's I place. I hate but... being poor. These beastly, sordid lodgings. Drawers that won't even open or shut. This one opens, darling. Mm, once tidying, though. Jarvis, why did you let us spend all your money? I suppose because we'd uh, such a good time spending it. If your friends ever ever guess the way we live... It... They'd say, poor Ivy, chained to that awful rotter, Lexton. No, I often believe it. It was my extravagance that... Jarvis, I can't think why you don't divorce me. One more remark like that and I'll put you across my knee and smack you till you're blue and... Oh, darling. My angel, I'd never divorce you in a million years. Just being with you makes up for the money, for living like this, for everything. Mm. Besides, yes. something will turn up. See if it doesn't. Yes, I, I'm sure it will. Nice party tonight, wasn't it? Quite nice, I thought. Such important people. Such excellent food. That Miles Rushworth, the publisher, uh, he's nice, don't you think? Mm, doesn't have to be nice. He's rich. Uh, what were you two whispering about all evening? Mm, jealous? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you, you've no need to be. He's going to give you a job. Uh, me? Mm -hmm. What kind of a job? Something in his office. Did you ask him for it? Not directly. I, I told him you'd lost your money through a, a crooked lawyer. <laughs> That's a new one. <laughs> well, he was very sympathetic. I believe he's, he's taken a fancy to you. Or oh, to you, darling. Jarvis. Not that I blame him in the least. You're the dearest girl any night. Oh, ever. darling. You're sweet. Ivy, I... Uh, uh, oh, Jarvis, if, uh, if you're going to work, you'd uh, better get some rest. <laughs> I must admit that Jarvis was right, in a way. Miles Rushworth had taken a fancy to me, and, well, perhaps I, I was a little flattered. He was so terribly rich and rather good-looking, and not that I thought of anything definite. After all, there was Jarvis, Jarvis and Roger. I rather suspected Roger would be difficult. But just how difficult, I, I didn't know until the next week. That night at Rose Arundel's war, we walked out on the balcony. Here, behind these plants. No one can see us here. No, Roger. Shouldn't we be dancing? I'd rather talk. It's the only chance I've had all night. You've been so occupied with Rushworth. Mr. Rushworth's going to find a job for Jarvis. Why shouldn't I be occupied I'm with him? I'm sorry, Ivy. But seeing you with another man, watching you laugh Roger, and talk... Roger, what am I going to do about you? After all, you... We must remember that I'm married. You were married when we met, right from the start. Yes, but somehow, somehow it was all so different then. I... I didn't realize how easy it was to drift into, into something dangerous. But I... And you, you were different, too, so gentle and kind. And, and I thought it was so noble of you establishing a laboratory down in the slums, working and living there. Noble? I couldn't afford to live anywhere else. I know, and yet... Oh, I admit it was intriguing, Roger, coming to see you at your laboratory. My own key, my own entrance off the alley. Oh, but then you used to laugh and you were gay and it was fun. It still is. No. Not anymore. Not since you became so serious. But I... Oh, really, Roger? you become quite impossible. You think that just because we're good friends that... Friends? We're in love with each other. No, we're not. I'm not. Ivy. No, Roger. It's got to stop now, tonight. Ivy, you don't mean that. You can't. What's make you change? Roger, I... Oh. The music started. I... I'm sorry, darling. I promised this dance. No, not yet. Please wait. Ivy. No, Roger. Please. Please. Ivy. I'll never give you up. Never. Never. That worried me. It worried me constantly. Roger might do something utterly stupid, and Mr. Rushworth might not understand. He was being so nice to Jarvis and me. We had a lovely new apartment for almost nothing at all. It seems that Miles, Mr. Rushworth, knew the owner. And Jarvis was so happy with his job, and I was so grateful. So it was only natural, when I was in the neighborhood, to drop by and chat with Miles. And not that there was anything improper, ever. At least, not until that afternoon. We'd been sitting there, talking, and neither of us had thought to turn on the light. I, I remember saying, oh, oh dear, it's grown so dark, hasn't it? And then suddenly, quite suddenly, I was in his arms. It was a long moment, and, and then... Ivy... That's the first time you ever called me that. Ivy, this is an utter catastrophe. 
Milo. I've always believed the most despicable thing a man can do is to make love to another man's wife. I'm, I'm terribly ashamed. But, Miles, I think... It happens I have some urgent business abroad, and it's taking this to make up my mind. You're going away? It's best for all concerned. I could have been very happy with you if... Goodbye, I... Goodbye, my dear. I knew what it was he hadn't said. If I weren't married, if, if there were no Jarvis, if we... Not that I, I thought much about it. I, I scarcely thought of it at all until later, until that day when Jarvis and I had a row. He said we were getting even deeper in debt. That it was all my fault that I was spending too much. He made quite a scene, completely unnerved me, and then went storming out of the flat and just at that moment as though I hadn't had enough. Hello. Hello, Ivy. Oh, it's you, Roger. I've been calling you all week. Your maid keeps telling me you're out. Darling, why wouldn't you talk to me? Because if I did, you'd want to see me. Of course I would. I... Oh, believe me, Roger, it's all for the best. I don't agree with you. Roger, I'm sorry you are being selfish. Selfish or not, I've got to see you. And if you won't come to me, I'm coming to you today. Don't be absurd. I mean it, Ivy. No, Roger, you mustn't. I... Very well. I'll be there. I'll come to you. Really, Roger, it's just awful for me being so worried all the time and Jarvis losing his temper and then you hounding me. I'm sorry, darling. You are in a state. But who wouldn't be? And I tell you, I can't go on like this. My dear, I... Oh, what have I to look forward to? Always poverty, always bills, always Jarvis harping at me. There's no right to do that. And you making it worse, plaguing me, threatening me, refusing to remember that I'm married and... Oh, I wish I were out of it all. Darling, darling, I'll straighten this whole thing out. I'll go to Jarvis and I'll tell him he's got to You'll give you up. You'll do nothing of the sort. But, Ivy, if we love each other... Professor, Professor, you'll want it. Roger. Behind the screen, quick. Yes, Martha? Oh, this is Coslow's little boy, sir. Uh, along at number eight. Got hold of some rat poison and I knew you'd have an antidote. Oh, please, Mr. Roger. They're waiting for you. I'll be right along. Uh, take that bottle, a medic. Oh, this, sir? Uh, no, not that one. That's poison. The bottle behind it. So oh, I had it, sir. Uh, tell him I'll be there in a moment. Uh, yes, sir. Ivy, darling. Roger, I'd better go. No, not yet, darling. Oh, please Roger, wait please. for me. Please, I'll only be ten minutes at the most. You can see it wasn't anything I'd planned. And in fact, I meant to leave. Truly, I did. I, I turned to the door. I, I started to go and... Then I saw the bottle. In that entire room, suddenly all I could see was that bottle. The white skull and crossbones, the red label marked poison. I stood there, frozen for a moment. And the whole thing seemed so simple. It took only a moment to pull out the bottle stopper and pour some of the powder into my purse. It was really so absurdly easy, except that just as I was putting the bottle down, Better do it while I... Oh, oh sorry, ma'am. I, I didn't know that anyone was here. I came in to put this bottle back. Don't like to have any poison off the shelf. You're waiting for the professor, ma'am? No, I was just going. Tell him I'll, I'll ring him in the morning. Ivy, that you? Yes, Jarvis. Oh, no, don't get up, dear. Thanks for calling me, dear. After the way I lost my temper, I was beginning to think you left me for good. No, I'd, I've been walking, walking and thinking. Exactly what I did, old girl. Jarvis, I... I've been nothing but trouble to you. Extravagance and debt. And... Oh, why don't you do the same thing and divorce me, darling? Ivy. Angel, I've told you I'll never divorce you in a million years. I'm sorry, Jarvis. Now, look, don't you go apologizing to me. But uh, how's forgetting me a brandy and soda? Yes, Jarvis. Hurry, darling. Yes, dear. He started complaining of the pains that night. It wasn't as though I wanted him to suffer. I didn't. I, I offered to call a doctor, but Jarvis wouldn't hear of it. All he wanted was another brandy and soda. And so I fixed him another one. In the morning, he was worse. I tried to make it easier for him. I offered to cancel all my appointments, but he, he simply wouldn't hear of it. And I couldn't just stay and watch the pain in his face. I couldn't, and so I left. Now I think I perhaps should have stayed. I 
should have stayed at home because late that same day. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Is Mrs. Lexton in? No, sir. Not now, sir. When will she be back? Oh, not till late, sir. She's gone out to early dinner and then the theater. Who is it, Emily? Oh, Mr. Lexton is home. Yes, sir. He's not been feeling at all well. Emily! Who's there? It's Roger. Roger Gretericks. Professor Gretericks? The one who... Roger! Come on in! Thanks. Now, if you're sure you've no objections, miss, I'll go in and visit with him for a while. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yes, I'm trying to find Mrs. Lexton. Mrs. Jarvis Lexton. I'm sure she's there. This is her maid. Yes, it's very important. If you could page her or something... Emily. Mrs. Lexton. What is it, Emily? Uh, Mrs. Lexton, uh, during your absence this evening... Uh... Oh, I beg your pardon. Who are you? I'm Dr. Berwick. I was called in by your maid while you were out. Mr. Jarvis was took real bad, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Berwick lives downstairs in the building. Oh, uh, I see. How is he? He's dead. Dead? I'm sorry. This puts me in an awkward position. I'm afraid I must ask for a post-mortem. Post-mortem? Why? Mrs. Lexton, I think your husband died of poison. In just a moment, you will hear Joan Fontaine, Patrick Knowles, and John Sutton in Act Two of Ivy. Do you take the word of the motion picture critics about a picture, or do you want to see and judge for yourself? Well, lots of folks want to judge for themselves. It's kind of an American trait, you might say. Just as in choosing a cigarette, folks like to try cigarettes and judge for themselves. Of course, they tried a lot of different brands during the wartime cigarette shortage. They couldn't get any one particular brand regularly then, so smokers compared and judged a wide variety of cigarettes. They judged them with their T-zones. That's T for taste and T for throat, where any cigarette is tested. That's right. You don't judge a cigarette by sight or feel or hearing, do you? Just by your T-zone, your sense of taste and the sensitivity of your throat. Well, the judgment of millions of smokers, after all that cigarette comparing, is that camels are best for rich, full flavor, coupled with cool, cool mildness. Yes, millions of smokers agree that camels are their choice for all-round smoking pleasure. Camels, always a leading favorite, are more popular than ever. More people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. And remember, camels by the carton are the best buy. Camel Cigarettes now present Act Two of Ivy, starring John Sutton, Joan Fontaine, and Patrick Knowles. Jarvis, dear sweet Jarvis, dead. I simply couldn't believe it at first. And then finally, I, I realized it was true, and I'm afraid I went completely to pieces. Dr. Berwick was most efficient, most professional. He gave me a sleeping draft and put me to bed. And early next morning, he was back again. Dr. Berwick and another man with him. Uh, Mrs. Lexton, this is Mr. Orpington, Inspector Orpington, Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? It seems that Dr. Berwick was correct. Mrs. Lexton, I'm afraid your husband died of poison. Oh, no. I'm forced to ask you some questions. If you'd rather I waited... No, I'll, I'll be all right. Mrs. Lexton, did your husband have anything to drink or eat yesterday while you were with him? Oh, yes, a, a brandy and soda just after lunch. Doctor, was that wrong? He, he begged for it, sir. No, I don't think the brandy and soda did any harm. Oh, I'm glad of that. If you know how Jarvis liked his... Mrs. Lexton, forgive me if I seem impertinent, but the poor fellow's life was insured, of course. Oh, no. Jarvis wasn't insured at all. But he was comfortably off. I mean, he's left you well provided for, I hope. Oh, no. All we had was his salary and, and a lot of debts. Don't worry about me. I'll find a Jarvis. You're very brave, Mrs. Lexton. Thank you. Now, there is one other little matter. Your friend, Professor Gretorix. Our friend. Yes, of course. Did you know he was coming here yesterday? He was here? Yes, with your husband. 
just a few hours before he died. Oh, I didn't know that. I understand he's telephoned you quite a bit this last week. But I never talked to him. No, we have your maid's word for that. She says she was instructed to tell him you were out. Yes, she was. I... But still, he was more your friend than your husband, wasn't he? That's true, Inspector. That's very sensible of you to admit it. You saw him alone at times? At times, not often. At his place? Oh, no, never. Uh, we walked together in the park, or perhaps we'd go to a picture gallery. Yeah, I understand. In other words, you were quite, well, quite fond of him. I am very fond of Professor Gretricks, but I love my husband. Naturally. Uh, tell me, was Professor Gretricks jealous of your husband? Uh, don't bother to answer that unless you want to. I suppose he was, in a way. But, but don't mistake, Roger's a wonderful man. I have no doubt of that. What did Mr. Lexton think of him? Oh, he liked him tremendously. He'd no idea, of course, that Roger was, well, in, in love with me. And you never told him? Oh, he'd have been so hurt. I, he trusted Roger as a friend. I see. Professor Gretorix lives in Perry Place? Yes, I, I think he does. Thank you. I'm grateful to you for being so frank. And please accept my very sincere sympathy. Dr. Berwick, I think we can go along now. Uh, coming, Inspector. Uh, Mrs. Lexton, I'll leave you a sedative. Try to relax. Thank you, Doctor. I'll try. Operator, hurry, please. I've got to get through. Hello, Roger. Is that you? Ivy, darling, I've been hoping you... Roger, wait, listen. Something dreadful's happened. Jarvis is dead. Dead? Last night, and, and Roger, I've got to talk quickly. That man might come back. Man? Oh, it's dreadful, and I'm so frightened that... They say that the poor darling didn't die a natural death. Not a natural death? I don't know what to think or talk. A horrible man came to see me. Something to do with the police. And, and now he's coming to see you. But why? Well, I'm not sure he, he asked such funny questions. Oh, Roger, he won't give me away. Give you away? He wanted to know if, if I was fond of you, if, if you loved me. And of course I said you didn't. And then he asked if I'd ever been to your place. He asked that? I said, no, of course I hadn't. What else could I say? But if you tell him that I have, that... If he gets in the papers and all our friends know about Oh, don't worry, darling. No one will know. I'll tell them you've never been here and I've never even seen you alone. Oh, but, Roger, what about your assistant? What if she's seen Arthur? me there? Oh, she's devoted to me. She'll say anything I tell her. She'll swear she's never laid eyes on you. Oh, Roger, thank but, you. Ivy, we mustn't see each other for a while. Not even call. Ivy, darling, you must be brave. I will, dear. I will. And try not to think about it. Try to put the whole thing out of your mind. Doctor's left me a sedative. I, I think I'll try to sleep. Mrs. Lexton. Mrs. Lexton, ma'am, you were awake. I'm in. Mrs. Lexton, the afternoon piper. Ma'am, he's been arrested. Arrested? Who? Professor Gretorix, ma'am. He's been arrested for murder. Mrs. Lexton, I know how trying these past few weeks have been for you, but as prosecutor for the Crown, I find myself in somewhat of a quandary. You know that the prisoner has pleaded not guilty. Yes. Yet he steadily refuses to testify, and so I have been forced to ask you to the witness box. Uh, I hope you understand. I think so, sir. Now then... Your maid, Emily Green, has testified that the prisoner used to telephone you sometimes as often as three times a day. Well, I... I... But that you never talked to him. Is that testimony true? Yes. Speak up, Mrs. Lexton. I didn't hear. She answered yes, my lad. Now, tell me, Mrs. Lexton, what were your real relations to and with Professor Gretrix? Uh, yes, Mrs. Lexton? Yes. We were friends, all three of us. My husband, too. Then, Mrs. Lexton, uh, try to answer this. Was there unknown to your husband any romantic relation between you and the prisoner at the bar? I... I, I mean, uh, was the prisoner in love with you? He... The witness will please answer the question. Must I? Must I? Must I answer? Counsel is entitled to a reply. Then... Then I... My lord. What? What's that? My lord, I wish to withdraw my plea and change it to guilty. Roger Gretorix, I pass upon you the sentence of this court, which is that you be taken hence to a lawful prison 
and thence to a place of execution, and that you there on the eighth day of June in the current year be hanged by the neck until you are dead. The eighth day of June, that's tomorrow. Dawn, they say. Five o'clock. In twelve hours, you... Well, it, it isn't my fault. I, I didn't ask him to do it. He, he couldn't resist playing the fool. Oh, if only I could rest. If only I could stop thinking. I, I don't know what I should have done if Lady Flora hadn't taken me until tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow it will be all over. And Miles will be back soon. There'll be nothing to worry about. Nothing. Nothing except... I... Why should I be frightened by Inspector Orpington? He said nothing. He, he's done nothing. And yet that day in court, the way he looked at me, if, if only I could be sure. If, if only I knew what he was thinking, what he was planning. If, if only I could be sure. Yes? Arthur, you remember me, Inspector Orpington? May I come in? Oh, yes, sir. I've got the place closed up, sir, except the laboratory. That'll do me fine. Yes, sir. In here, sir. Thank you. I should have asked to come in here anyway, Martha. You would, sir? Yes. I wanted to have a look at that other door. Other door, sir? That one over there leads out on the alley, doesn't it? Yes, sir. So anyone could come and go here without being seen? Yes, sir, if... It... If one had a key, sir. Martha, I just learned today that Professor Gretericks had an extra key made for that door. About a year ago. Who used that key, Martha? Could it have been Mrs. Lexton? Oh, please, sir. I've told you a hundred times. I know, I... I know, that Mrs. Lexton's never been here. But, Martha, don't you realize in less than 12 hours they'll hang Professor Gretericks? Oh, no. They'll hang him for something he didn't do. He's shielding someone. And you're helping him. Oh, I... What is it, Martha? Say it. I can't. I promised. Promised what? <laughs> Whom? Oh, no. All right, then, I'll ask. All you have to do is answer. Was Mrs. Lexton ever here? Oh, Was she? Tell me. Oh, yes. She was here, standing by the jar of poison. By the poison? <laughs> Martha, you'll never feel sorry for this. Come along, we're going over to Scotland Yard. Emily, Emily, are you sure? Are you sure he said reprieve? I'm quite sure, Mrs. Lexton. It was that inspector who called. He said to tell you there was new evidence, ma'am, and he was sure he knew the guilty party. Emily, go tell Lady Flora I'm leaving. I'll go back to the flat. You can pack my things and follow later. Hurry. Yes, ma'am. New evidence. New evidence. They, they couldn't have found out. They couldn't. They... Miles. Miles will help me. He won't let them hurt me. Miles, he'll be home soon. His cable said so. He loves me. I know he does. He'll do anything for me. Anything. <laughs> Inspector, you're sure you have enough evidence? I'm positive, Martha. All we needed was a motive, and the cable from Rushworth gave us that. Well, fortunately, we found it when we searched the flat. Oh, then all she wanted was Rushworth. Oh, murders be done for less money than he has. Inspector. Oh, there's Waters now. He's brought her in. All right, Waters. Inspector Orpington. Where is she, Waters? Well, sir, I waited for her on the street in front of her flat... And then she came along, sir, and I stepped up to her nice and quiet-like. Yes? She started to run, sir, across the road. And just then a big lorry came along. Bad? I... I believe, sir, the Lexton case is closed. <laughs> Stars Joan Fontaine and Patrick Knowles will return to the Camel Screen Gill microphone in just a moment. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. That survey went from coast to coast, covered big towns and little towns. 
Three leading independent research organizations asked 113,597 doctors living in all those different areas what cigarette they smoked. The brand name most was Camel. And now before we ring down our curtain, a final round of thanks to you, Joan Fontaine, Patrick Knowles, John Sutton, and Dan O'Herlihy for a most exciting half hour. Well, appearing with the Camel Screen Guild players is always a red-letter event for us. We know how much this program contributes towards supporting the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. And believe me, we're all very proud to share in that work. Now, Joan, you have something to say? I certainly have, Pat. It's rather a, a relief to start being that horrid girl Ivy and to say something nice for a change. In fact, I think it's very nice. You know the makers of Camel cigarettes send free camels every week to the men in servicemen's hospitals. This week, free camels go to Veterans Hospital, Van Nuys, California, United States AAF Station Hospital, Scottfield, Illinois, and the U.S. Naval Hospital, Newport, Rhode Island. Happy smoking, boys. Your camels are on the way right now. And good night, everybody. Don't forget, Monday night is always a brilliant event in the Camel Screen Guild Theater. Hollywood's greatest stars in Hollywood's greatest stories. Next Monday night, a story included in every list of the ten best pictures of the year. From the brilliant pen of Noel Coward, a story you love. Brief Encounter, starring those great favorites, Irene Dunn and Herbert Marshall with Tom Conway. Be sure to listen. Ivy was directed by Bill Lawrence, adapted for radio by Harry Cronman, with music by Wilbur Hatch, and was presented through the courtesy of Sam Wood and the Universal International Studios, next releasing Secret Beyond the Door. Joan Fontaine will next be seen starring in Letter from an Unknown Woman, a Rampart production for Universal International Release. Patrick Knowles will soon be seen in the Paramount picture Dream Girl. Listen to Von Monroe with Colonel Stupnagel and their guests, the Harmonic Cats, on the air for Camel Cigarettes every Saturday night over most of these CBS stations. This is Michael Roy at Hollywood saying good night and won't you have a camel? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.